first of all, thank you for attending my talk. And also thanks to the uh, organizer to uh, inviting me and accepting my uh, talk proposal. And uh, I would like to start first with the disclaimer. This time there will be no live demo or fancy other stuff in my presentation because I have 36 slides, so I have to hurry a bit with 36 slides. And also because of Murphy's Law, usually if that's why live demo is something is uh, not working like it should be. And because of the amount of slides, I may go a bit faster, or there may be less time for questions, but I mean, in all the other talks there were also more questions, so just hit me up later, and if I'm talking too fast, just throw something at me and yell at me, or, or something else. So, and uh, we are talking about, um, or this talk will be about uh, building and maintaining Consistently improving API or API related documentation with uh, docs as codes. And what I would like to say in the docs ops way. Yeah. So, in a nutshell, what, what is that? We will also go later a bit more to it. Basically, that means that you are adapting to the tooling and workflow of your developers and using the same techniques or close techniques to uh, improve your documentation. If that now sounds really technical to you, because maybe you're a more product owner and not a developer, so don't be scared, we will look into that and uh, it will be fine. Are you still here? Right? Okay. So on the agenda for the first, we will do a really short introduction for about doc set codes. So what does it mean? What is it? We will have a short look into the advantages of it, why it may be good for you, why you should use it. But also we will talk about a couple of things that you may want to avoid from the beginning, because otherwise you would have maybe really bad experience. And we also look at it how, if you have no clue about it and you never used it, what are different ways to get started. So first of all, um, let's start uh, with a quick poll that we can uh, get to know each other. Who is already using docs at code here? Awesome. Who is also using it not only for deploying docs, but also using it for intensive testing of the quality of your documentation? <laughs> I want yes. <laughs> so let's start first with the def definition, because I called uh, basically the title is like stunning documentation. What? is stunning for me. Stunning for me are different things. First of all, it's about the appealing factor of your docs. Docs should be appealing for your audience. Meaning like, it has to, um, you can ask yourself, does my docs are looking good? Is it just a huge chunk of boring text and people get bored in 10 seconds? Or is it actually a nice feeling of people start browsing it and, and reading it? Is it easy on your eyes? Are you making sure that your documents are not too long, that your headers are understandable, that you're constantly structured your documentation, things like that. Also about he like, like healings are already said, but also sentences, use short sentences and not sentences which are miles long. Then also about the content structure. Does the structure of your documentation make sense for the audience? Because remember, you're not writing for yourself, you're writing usually for an audience. And also, closing to that, is it also logical for a user? Does it make sense that the user basically finds what she's looking for? It's also about clarity. Are your docs are clear? Are your user or audience are understanding what you are writing? Even if your docs are completely typo-free, grammatically correct and stuff like that, does that doesn't mean that your user actually is understanding what you're writing about. And if you're talking about grammar, how are you doing with grammar? Is our grammar fine? Or we're we using like, I thought someone speak Dutch with German grammar, so it's uh, understandable, okay. And also, see you. Are my docs are go doing well with search engine optimizations? People are finding if they are using Google, DuckDuck, or whatever to, uh, to find what they're looking for. And last but not least, of course, accessibility. Are my docs are accessibility? Are they working with green leaders? Are they working for colorblind people or for people with other handicap, handicaps? And 
So, next up, Toxia Stone, what does it mean? That's a huge text. So, basically, applying DOCSIS codes, assuming that you're using the same tooling for writing documentation as you're using for working on your code. Like the same manner you work with your code editor, you use the same code editor for, for documentation. And um, depending on your documentation, like if you, for example, you hook up Windows to your code editor for testing your Python code, Ruby code, PHP, whatever, you can do the same with, um, for documentation. You can hook up Linters for checking your grammar to make sure that uh, if you decided to work in American English that actually all your docs are in American English, that you're not mixing American English and uh, British English. <coughs> So, and this is really what I want to stress out. Docs code is not only about this uploading my documentation to a developer portal, to building my static site and deploy it, or to, I don't know, Cloudflare or something else. This, this uploading and appearing the, doc of the documentation is just basically, at least for me, the ice of the cake. Mm -hmm. Like, for me, Docs code is 90% really about testing the hell out of my documentation. And after that, only if the tests are passing, uploading and publishing it. So, why I should use it? Why is Dr. Scott a good thing to do? Because consistent tested APIs and documentation can help your product and also your development cycle. It's a really important trust signal to your audience, but also to your developers. And also, like writing your documentation according to a fine, defined standard, reflecting your product and your company is really, really good for SEO because you make sure that all your stuff is consistent on the internet, which is making it easier to find and also creates a better feeling, like it's a trust signal for people who are using it. <laughs> so, but let's first start with a big, big warning, or what I call attention. I mean, all of that sounds. Perfect, it's always too good to be true, right? I mean, you're just doing docs as code, and then all or a lot of your problems will be magically solved. So, since you're already using, for example, continuous integration, the setup will be really easy because you're using maybe already Bootkite or Jenkins or something else. Your developers were less grumpy with you because they are happy because you started using their tooling, makes them really happy. Your manager or your product owner will be happy because you're able to deploy faster. It means faster product cycle. That also means your developer, your product manager is happy and you are happy because yeah, everyone is happy. It sounds really good, sounds it, right? But I'm really sorry, sadly, Docs code isn't all about rainbows and unicorns. I mean, who is using it here? Whoever Git, version control system Git, whoever had, I don't know, issues with rebasing or weird error messages or something else was not working and you start pulling out your hair or you're screaming or throwing stuff out of the window or something. Yeah. Right, and there's only one part. I mean, there are lots of different things or parts which also you have to take care of. It's starting from Git, it's starting with making it work locally, configure with your editor, usually from, from developers, then you get a lovely answer, well, it's working on local on my machine, so it should work on your machine. So, like I said, it's not always that easy, and it's always not, not always unicorns and rainbows. Besides, there's even more on top of it, and this is security and permissions. So, the most important thing, avoid disaster. Working with Docs code can help to improve the quality and speed of the publication process, but take in mind you also have a huge learning curve. You need to have to understand how your CI system works, how your local setup works, how Git is working, how security is working, because you don't want really want to avoid that you per accident deleting content or publishing the wrong branch of your repository or things like that. So, also, make sure that all of your tests 
are working and that you actually can trust the results of your tests. It's nice you have tests, but you really have to make sure that actually you get mind mindful of the results. Developers, DevOps, or your SRE team, they will happily help you to set up a secure system where you also take care of securities, protect your Git repositories, and things like that. Because also, like, everyone is happy, and also in the long run means less work for them. So, now the big starters with Docs and Code, where or how I should start about it. And like, uh, I really like this quote from uh, Margaret Bloomstein. If you don't, how, if you don't know what you want to test or how you want to test, how actually you want to test. So, actually, to test in something, you have to make thing, you have to make sure what you want to test, and that's basically where content strategy comes in and can help you. <coughs> Think about things like method architecture, editorial style guides, markup style guides, your object different key results, and also like typical standard uh, rot analysis. Is it redundant, outdated, or trivial? And I mean, this is not the golden ticket. There are lots of different ways to do it. It really depends on uh, your use case, your needs, your goals, what you want to achieve. So, coming back to docs as code, like uh, what it means in the core. At, at, in the core, for me in general, it breaks down to five main points. That is, first, develop a content strategy, develop second and editor, editorial style guide for and to start up from a markup language, then use tools like uh, for example, Google Analytics, Matamo, uh, your issue trackers, your user feedback, everything what you can ha get your hands on to analyze your content. If, do we have something? Are we missing something? All that stuff is really important. And use this input to develop checks, write checks to test for things what you figured out and hand from analysis what you are missing. And then in the end, basically, you run the tests, make sure the tests are passing, if the, pa if the tests are passing, deploy your, your documentation and your APIs and be, uh, be happy. This is basically the same like in, an, uh, like in a picture. And this is now more or less what I call a full-blown CI/CD pipeline. But you do not even, maybe you're not using already CI/CD. Maybe you're just using your editor. This is also fine. I mean, it's not only about like doing all the stuff automatically. Remember always, it starts locally. The most important thing is if you have, that you have to find checks, you have to find your goal, and then you test constantly and consistent against this goal. So remember, basically, it's just write, test, and then uh, share it. Are you still with me, or you're not already completely confused? No? OK, great. So I mentioned it already, like, for me, this whole thing basically is starting with quality insurance. So let's have a really short look. What is quality, quality insurance or what I'm meaning when I'm speaking about uh, quality insurance? And quality insurance is a process of verifying whatever a product meets the required specs and customer expectations. So this is basically what it what it means for me. Basically, you have a guideline, you have a defined goal, and to write tests, and then you check and make sure. And if you do it over the long time, you can lovely see like how my docs are, the quality is improving or decreasing. And then maybe you have to adjust the tests, or you have to adjust your goal, or there's something else wrong. But it's then also easier to um, to find out. And um, why is it important? Why is quality insurance important? Product documentation is an important marketing seed for promoting your product but also your organization. If, basically for me, if I check your website and I see it, that your docs are really, really bad, it, for me it doesn't matter if your product is super, super awesome. If for me your documentation quality is lacking a lot, then I'm not sure if I really trust you because I don't see the motivation on your side to update your documentation constantly. Again, that is uh, this whole thing with trust. Also, if I have good documentation, 
meaning that my customers or clients can find what they are looking for in my documentation. That also usually means I'm getting less ticket in my tickets in my headless system. That means my developers and uh, support team has time to do other stuff. And also, if you, you can use it internally, if you have really awesome and good documentation, it helps you also to onboard new colleagues a lot faster, which is also good for your company because it's cheaper and you are more productive. And that, again, trust. Everything is trust. <laughs> So like, like I said before, in, it's not all rainbow and unicorns. You have to, if you start with it, you have to understand what you're using. You have to understand your tools. I see like, if I brought on the internet, I see lots of time like companies who are jumping in this whole docs code and then they're writing lovely blog posts, which is awesome. But if you look, if you look deeper into it, <coughs> at least I think it's really frightening because they are using some really insecure or dodgy, budgy setups, and in the long time, it really hurts. So, simple things to start with: make sure you have your branches protected if you're using version control systems. If you're writing checks, there are lots of different programming languages and write checks. Make, make sure that these checks are also valid according to the programming language you're writing in. This is good for security, but also for speed, usually. Then also, start simple and easy. Don't start with the whole pipeline with 20 different tests and then getting confused. Start with basic tests, make sure that they are working, and then later, if you're sure that they're working, then extend and write the next one. Also, if you have, I don't know, 20, 40 different tests, make sure that they are depending on each other. <coughs> Meaning, like, I only run test B if test A is succeeded, for example, because otherwise it will take you a long, long time to run, depending on your tests, to actually get any results. So and then we are back to uh, where I can start or how to start with quality insurance. Again, it's basically coming back, for example, to a style guide, define a style guide, where I want to be, what kind of words we want to use in the company, what type of terminology we want to use. Also, user stories are a great way. Come up with different user stories, then ask external people, do you want to be the test person for user story A or B? This is really, really helpful. Usually, testing your own user stories is not working properly because you know the product anyway. So think a bit out of the box. And last but not least, of course, analytics and analysis. Check all the things in the website. Check search engines, check your log files, check your issue trackers, stack overflow, other online <laughs> websites or forums. Try to scrape all the data that's possible about your product or what you're doing. Compare that with your documentation, and then you also are able to figure out where I have to improve. So, and like I said before, everything really starts local. CI CD is really cool and do it automatically, but this is for me not the, the only thing about Docs code. So really start local. This is, for example, like, um, this is BB Edit. BB Edit is um, one of my uh, helping hands, aka robots. Like, and what he, he is doing, basically, after I'm done writing, and when I then uh, commit it, BB Edit is running a couple of base tests, and only if the base tests are basically passing, I'm allowed to uh, push it to my uh, repository. And usually I do the same tech, uh, checks already, already local, manually in my editor, but to just to make sure that I'm not too lazy and skip them, this is automated with my Git hooks. And it's running different tests for grammar, spell check, against uh, open API specs and things like that. And then this test now is passing, now BBH uh, is telling me that he's happy, everything is passing. He staged my changes already, and he's also reminding me to use uh, meaningful commit message when I commit. And um, let's go back to the editor. And yeah, um, I mean, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. To be fair, this new job is from three months ago, I think. And I'm super happy that uh, all these issues are now fixed. 
So this is like an example of basically my editor setup configured with certain tests which I do. And basically here my editor is checking for typos. Well, my editor already found two typos in this one document. Then also, according to my standards, it was, uh, the check is complaining about uh, too much uh, passive warning. And one of the tests I like the most is the thing that if people use click here in their documentation because they are too lazy to say click on this link to end up on this certain page of my documentation or something like a meaningful description which is, I mean, people think that it's not important but then again if you're coming back to accessibility that is actually really important and accessibility will rent you on that. Do we have someone on Twitter here? Ah, damn. So this is an example of using like an uh, I use here Lighthouse to check some general accessibility performance and other things of uh, the Twitter API developer portal. And according to my standard, they are not really bad, but there are certainly room for improvement. For, for sure, if you check the accessibility, because they are only at 68%, which is for my best uh, kind of bad. And, um, this is a check which I run locally and also automated via CI once a week on different portals and setups because if you do that over a certain amount of time, it will tell you how I am improving. And again, it's not only about the accessibility of best practices or see you. For me, it's also about performance. I don't like to wait for 30 seconds till I see something on a web page. I want to see it immediately. I mean, it's not always possible, maybe of slow internet, but usually it should be fast. And um, now we're moving on, we have a real fun start. This is like doing all the things automated and continuous integration. And in the following, we will see a couple of uh, different continuous integration setups. And they're all using the same check to checking different websites. And there are literally no limitations about which CI, CE system you use. It really depends on what you're already using, what you're familiar with, what you like, what you don't like. <coughs> it's possible with all of them. Doesn't matter if it's CircleCI, Jenkins, Travis, Drone, Bootkite, GitHub Actions, GitLab is also working, RWS pipelines. So, yeah, take what you like. This is, for example, like. Uh, running a link check against the markdown document in, uh, in CircuitCI. He will do exactly the same check in the same document on, uh, with GitLab. He will do the same check again with, uh, with DroneCI. And this is different, so it's, it's the resolution it's a bit bad, but maybe you can see it on, uh, really on the bottom. Basically, it's telling red. This is basically the same check as a GitHub action, but actually this check is failing because there's one broken link. So and this is nice, basically, because first, I'm sure that my link checking setup is working, but also it's reporting me back. So here, for example, I'm not able to, uh, to merge my pull requests. Still, I'm technically I'm able, but I'm not allowed to merge my pull request because I have a broken link. And like I mentioned before, like what we just saw a couple of minutes ago, Lighthouse, this is the same test running as a GitHub action once a week, automated on GitLab, and then sending me the output as HTML. So, Basically now the key takeaway are all together. You want to start early, you want to start small. You want to know or figure out what you want to check against or where you want to improve. Start locally, always better. Make sure that your checks are valid and your checks are working if you're trusting your checks. Take care about security later on about your Git setups and your permissions and your file system setups, and also if you use CI systems, about proper configured CI systems. Take your time. All of that, usually, you can't do that in five minutes. You really have to take time. Like, as was mentioned in the talk before, 
take some time to make sure in transition that it's working. And also reevaluate every couple of months or weeks, check if everything is working, if I'm still meeting my goals, and things like that. And, uh, okay, questions? I skip that now. And, uh, of, uh, in case someone was wondering how I am, so that is now the who I about me slide, so that was me for today. <coughs> I'm Sven, I'm working as a Docker engineer for three weeks. And uh, now we are basically in the end, so thanks all of you, and thank you also to Polonex and all my colleagues who were helping to make the slides look way better than they were before, and also <coughs> were nice to be really kind to me after a couple of dry runs. And um, yes, uh, thank you all.